the history of automotive engineering and in racing, the stars that have shined the brightest have always been those cars that developed the innovation that enabled them to have long records of success that put everybody else out of business. And the first time we ever saw that happen in the history of cars was with a Tori Bugatti. He did that when nobody else even knew what a real automobile was. He made the automobile into something more than a variation of another concept. He made the automobile its own machine that had its own identity. And because of his ability to be so resourceful, to think outside of the box and do groundbreaking things, he, for 20 years, captivated what the essence of the car was as far as its evolution. And what we see today is, in its, in its brightest examples, only an attempt to have that kind of ingenuity again. Anybody who's watching this knows about cars. They know about cars today. But what we're gonna do now is talk about how we got here today. Because race cars weren't always race cars. Cars weren't always cars. Somebody made the car into a concept that could stand on its own, into something that would be here to stay. And we're gonna look at that individual who made that happen, to whom we are indebted for advancements in themes and concepts that are still being employed today. Anybody that knows about our company knows that we specialize in, in the stars of the pre-war racing scene, Bugatti, Alfa Romeo, etc. But before these cars were on the scene, the evolution of the automobile up to that point had some big breakthroughs. It all began with horseless carriages, which were adaptations of another machine. They were not automobiles. They were horse-drawn wagons with very rudimentary and crude design features, suspension, etc. Motors were put on them and you had the first automobile, but it wasn't really an automobile. And as the automobile, in theory and in concept, advanced, so did the ways in which people figured out how to make them go faster. So going from a little one-cylinder engine, you now went to a big four-cylinder engine, bigger and bigger displacement, and you had something that would go fast, but it was still only ever an adaptation of something else, of a horseless carriage. The earliest cars were little tiny you know, curved dash things, you know, where you would have, like the chassis in a lot of cases, like in the early Oldsmobile, would actually be just one big leaf spring. And then, you know, you'd have shackles that would go down to a, an axle and stuff. You'd have a little tiny one lunger engine in the middle with a chain, and then a body in the front, you know, that would kind of do this type of thing. And, um, you know, you would sit here, that's a, that's a human. And then you have your steering, which would be tiller steering coming up. So that's like the first car, you know, like early Oldsmobile, 1900, 1901. You have these little setups. But it's, it's a horseless carriage. It's not a car. In fact, to this day in the United States, anything pre-1915 is a horseless carriage, not an automobile. You get a plate that says horseless carriage on it. So you take, you take a square car chassis, and then you change that to something that Bugatti did, which was sort of like this. It's not the best, kind of a bottle-shaped thing. And then you'd have an engine that's back here. You have a front axle that's up here, little gearbox differential and um, yeah and then your engine would be lower you know a lateral view of this would be you know in the old cars it would be kind of like this but in a Bugatti it would be you have an engine that you know a lot of the engine is down here and then your front axle is, is kind of up here so a big difference from this to that. A 
And Tori Bugatti was a designer and an engineer in certain capacities that did work for a lot of companies on a freelance basis and he got into arguments with just about everybody who he worked with which prompted him to start his own company. And his first car uh, that that's, was really his own was the Type 13 Brescia. And that car was originally designed and built in 1910 and saw a lot of success early on. Um, it was one of the first engines ever to have four valves per cylinder, so a 16 valve four cylinder engine, single overhead cam, and it was also one of the first race cars to have suspension all the way around, to have four springs. And with that car, he saw incredible success, and that's how his company really got its boost. There was a car that was built for 10 years, and by 1920, he took four of them to the Grand Prix in Brescia and won first, second, third, and fourth place. When Ettore Bugatti began working for himself, his first car was the Type 13 Brescia brought out in 1910. It saw its ultimate peaks in victory in 1921. The Type 35 was initially engineered in 1922 and saw its victory through the late 20s. It was developed then into the Type 51 in 1928 and it was being used along with the Type 35 into the 1930s and both of those cars were winning races as late as the 1950s. But at Tori's two cars that brought him the most victory then were the Type 13 and the Type 35. We're talking today about the Type 35 and the Type 13 because for a span of 20 years they were the cars that were the most groundbreaking and revolutionary examples of design engineering in the automotive and racing world. So the innovations in Bugatti's race cars we see in terms of the engine design, as far as the overall weight of the car, alloy wheels, handling, um, a, a huge component therein that was a part of the puzzle was suspension. If you think of a horse's carriage, think of a horse-drawn carriage, and what does suspension look like? You have two giant leaf springs fully elliptical in most cases, and you just sort of bounce along down the road. It's not a suspension package that's set up for cornering or racing or anything else. It's meant to deal with the roads. Um, Bugatti got clever on that. The, the suspension used in the most early days, like carriage suspension, would be fully elliptical leaf springs. So you have one set like this and one set like that, and then, you know, it on top of it, basically underneath it. So it's a sandwich and they go together. Uh, on a Type 35, let's say this is the chassis looking at from the side, you have semi-elliptical, so you have your axle in the front and you have just semi-elliptical, so it's one half. And then on the back you have quarter elliptical, so it's one half of the semi-elliptical like on the front. And that's the same suspension also used in the, uh, in the Brescia. Now it's, it's mounted in parallel with the chassis on a lot of early cars, I mean something as basic as a, as a Model T, if you're looking at the car from the front, you would have a fully elliptical spring going along the front axle instead of opposed with it. On a Bugatti, you would have a semi-elliptical thing opposed with it. So on a lot of early cars, having this setup where it's just basically under the front axle like on a carriage is typical. Another one of Ettore's design implementations that served him very well was the use of monoblock engines. His engines in the Type 35, his most famous car, were inline eight-cylinder engines, single overhead cam initially, and then double overhead cam. The block was bi-block, meaning that they were uh, cast in pairs, four and four, uh, pretty small. For a 2.3 or two-liter engine, divided amongst eight cylinders with a pretty long stroke. It was a skinny little thing. What he did is the, the block, which is the only part of the engine, which is cast iron, is in one piece. The head and the lower portion of the block are, are, are all one piece. Um, the pro is that it's fantastic in terms of maintenance. You don't have to worry about blowing a head gasket. And when you make a car in the 1920s that'll wind up to five and a half thousand revs, that's a big deal. Um, the only disadvantage, and, and one that I can personally relate to a lot, is in the manufacturing, 
you have to do all your machining of your valve surfaces from inside the cylinder. If you've seen a Bugatti block, it's an engine that has a very long stroke, so you have to be very clever as far as how you get down in there to machine your valves. But uh, as far as use, it is a wonderful way of reducing maintenance liability. The worst thing that could happen during a Grand Prix race is that you blow a head gasket. You don't have to worry about that with this engine. Engine placement had previously been known as a very large engine that was you know, pretty much right over the front axle and it was sitting up high, which just doesn't fare well for weight distribution and handling and all of that. Bugatti took the engine, reduced it from a gigantic seven or eight liter thing and made it relatively smaller in his Grand Prix cars, you know, around two liters. Um, and he put the engine very low, first of all. It was so low that the lower crankcase was actually part of the chassis and it was shoehorned in so that the, the chassis mounting feet became structural components of the car. He also moved the engine back to where the front of the block was a good eight inches behind the front axle. This was groundbreaking because it put all the weight in the car in a completely different area and it also reduced the redundancy and structural components of the car, doing away with unnecessary cross members and using the engine as that sort of um, you know, feature creating stability. Nobody put much thought into this before Bugatti did it and when he started doing it others figured out Alfa Romeo followed suit. Other people Oddly enough, didn't really figure it out. One of the many tricks that Bugatti had up his sleeve were alloy wheels. The car had never had aluminum wheels before. Why, why would you make a, a wheel out of metal when there are all these trees around, right? I mean, all the cars have fucking wooden spokes. And that's why they flew apart at 100 miles an hour. But Bugatti had this idea that, hey, aluminum is strong enough that we can make an engine out of. Why don't we make a wheel out of it? And then we'll throw the brake drum into the same casting so that all that heat we generate from braking, instead of needing to be veined from the, the wind passing over all the little fins, can also be dispersed through the mass of the wheel itself. And that's what he did. And that's why the cars he built undoubtedly had better stopping power than anything back in the day, which turns out is really good for a race car. No one had really thought of that. It's a race car. Why do you want to stop? It's for going, not stopping. And Tori himself said, I build my cars to go, not to break. Of course, it was kind of funny because his cars had the best braking of anybody. The, the Bugatti is the only car that I can drive anywhere today, and I don't have to drive it like an old car. Usually when you're in an old car, you, you use old car driving rules, you know, you keep like 12 car lengths in front of you and, and somebody half a mile up starts to, to break and, and you're putting your foot in it. With a Bugatti, you can drive like any car today. The thing stops on a dime. It's incredible. Aerodynamics were certainly a part of it. For Bugatti, um, a minimalistic approach was very important and having as little as possible on the car was his aim. And there was always with Bugatti, uh, a sort of tie-in to understanding the car as an artistic expression. There was no divide between what is intrinsically artistic and what is best suited to engineering. They were, in his mind, one and the same. And, you know, it's been said of, of his understanding of aerodynamics that a car is like a beautiful woman and that the less she's wearing, the better it looks and functions. <laughs> you had contoured bodywork with Bugatti in the form of creating what was then very aerodynamic design features. So instead of a very boxy square type body, you had a boat tail design and when Bugatti designed the uh, Type 35, it wasn't the first boat tail design, but it was the first car that I think really put that kind of, of concept on the map and it, it was certainly the, the most successful boat tail design of the day. Bugatti was the guy who took a concept that um, was, you, you weren't even dealing with an automobile. And starting from that, he changed enough things that it now became an automobile. And then other guys continued to uh, work off of that and add to it. He didn't make a perfect car per se, but he made the first race car. Cars as horses carriages that were just made 
to go a little bit faster each time transitioned into something completely new, a new philosophical entity, something totally other. And that transition is best understood in looking at the life of Vittoria Bugatti. He took the automobile, and in my opinion, he took it from being an adaptation of a different machine that was just being progressively modified into something which became its own concept. It became an automobile. It was no longer a horse's carriage, it was now an automobile. And that was through incredibly innovative and, and, and truly genius concepts that he employed, and he employed them very quickly and, and, and in multiple sort of design features at once. Um, going from uh, suspension that didn't work to, to remarkable suspension and handling, uh, to steering, to weight distribution, to moving engines lower and putting them back. Um, not caring so much about huge displacement as much as where the weight in the car was. All of these little tricks he figured out and he wasn't modifying something that had already been done. He, he wasn't doing work that was just a variation on a theme. He created the theme from nothing. And it was so groundbreaking that people even to this day think that, that he was divinely inspired. You hear Bugatti being referred to as early as the 20s as the divine Bugatti because of how otherworldly it was compared to everything else with four wheels.